Welcome back to The Exemplist. I'm your host, Charles McDonald. Today, we're talking about week four of the NFL. Some teams that are having a little shaky start to season, but maybe there's a path for success as the season moves along. I'm joined by my buddy, Nate Tice, who is a Yahoo Sports contributor and also the host of the Athletic Football Show. We're just going to get right into it. See you in a bit. All right. I am here. With Nate Tice, like I said, Yahoo Sports contributor, host of the Athletic Football Show, a very good friend. Nate, how you doing today, bud? And definitely not someone that jumps the gun. No. As as I uh, <laughs> as I'm getting used to maybe these Yahoo purple colors for the for the podcasting world. No, I'm doing very well. I'm ready to maybe do a little fixing, maybe a little talk myself off the ledge with some preseason takes, and also just ready to hang out with my buddy. I hope you're doing yeah. all right, man. Oh, I. <laughs> I'm on the ledge. I'm sure as you saw this weekend, I was posting during the Falcons game in our group chat. I'm on the I ledge. I need to not so. talk to you during those games because you get in my head and then I, I just start going down a spiral. I, that's, yeah. I, I try to be so neutral with everything that usually none of this affects me that bad. But now I've got takes committed and I talk to you during these games and it's just like, it, just it like just fire hurts. everyone. Fire trade, everyone. Trade four first round picks for Kyler Murray. I don't care. Just I'm not used to this. Shaky quarterback lifestyle. Literally my whole life, it's been Vic one year, Ryan, and now two years post Ryan. I'm like, I'm shaking. I need my quarterbacks oh, back. <laughs> you and Justice, because Justice yeah. Skater, who's a Packers fan, like you guys going through quarterback withdrawals is, yeah, I feel bad. We got to get you guys to a halfway. Yeah, this is, this is the <laughs> first time. clinic. <laughs> Look, and you know, I, I we'll, we'll talk about the Falcons a little bit later, but it just, it pains my soul that the first year the Falcons have a real defense. In my, like, adult life. Because during the Matt Ryan years, they had, like, you know, the fake good, bend, don't break, turnover defenses yeah. every once in a while. Yeah. But they never had a real unit, and they have one now. And the offense is terrible. And it just, it hurts because I've I've never, you know, it's like the Friday the Friday quote where he's like, yeah, you guys never got two things that match together. You never got no peanut butter, no jelly, no ham, no burger. Like, come on. Right. What's going on? But we'll get to uh. them in a minute. First, <laughs> as we've started every podcast... Uh, on the, the relaunch. Funny things from the weekend. Did you see the Rodney Harrison clip where he was trying to go Chris Jones into... Okay, no, but I actually... What happened there? Because I, I, I saw a tweet about it. I meant to watch it, but no, I'm aware that's he was trying to bait Chris Jones to maybe like sl- do some slandering on Zach Wilson and then like Chris Jones kind of took the high road and Rodney couldn't help himself or something like that. I mean, even using the word bait is kind of underselling it because usually like if you're trying to bait someone to say something, maybe you'll be a little sly, like a yeah. little, Chum. you know, right. He chummed the waters. Like he was just throwing guts and some blood into the water. <laughs> Correct. He, at one point, first he started off like trying to bait him, right. Saying, well, you know, Zach Wilson played a little bit better than most people were, were, were expecting was that a surprise for you guys and chris was like you know first he was like ah you know this is a a guy who we have a lot of respect for blah 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 and then rodney was like he said wait but when you're watching these tapes you don't think oh man that guy's trash i was like whoa whoa like you're never gonna get you're never gonna get someone to say that on a nationally televised game where there's more viewers than ever because you know we have the swifty stuff going on yeah and then you know, I had someone bring it up to me like, wow, this morning. I was like, wow, that's a kind of surprising that Rodney Harrison would do something like that. I was like, is it? <laughs> or, did you watch him play ever? <laughs> <laughs> this is what he's known for. Right. Uh, was, was he at the side table? Uh, or, yeah, or, the like, the, the, no, no, I'm saying because like NBC's got like five different tables now. Like they got oh, five it's... different groups to talk about each game. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. So, I can't. I can't even keep track of who's on the main team anymore. I don't. I don't know who's the A, B, C, D. I, actually, I know who's D. I, I think it's pretty who, obvious who, who they they have fantasy who, in the newsbreaker. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. for yeah. Barry, yeah, <laughs> I think that's yeah. D. But then you have you know Collinsworth with Dungey and, and Harrison, and it's just always like okay. But I, it's so funny to me because they just have the one line, so it's like, man, that must be so brutal. You waste all that time, you spend all that time just to get one sentence in, and it's like okay, let's get to analyst number twelve uh, because we <laughs> gotta get his one sentence in, and it's like one after. It's like you know, like in class when you guys were reading a book in like elementary school, and it's like okay, everyone. One one sentence at a time, or like one paragraph at a time. All right, little Timmy. All right, now Janie. All right, now Nate. Everyone's reading one paragraph. That's how I feel like NBC preseason analysis or pre-show analysis is, and post-show, I guess. 
Sorry. But, that was just my little rant about NBC's 20 analysts that I see on the sidelines before every single game. That's the one thing that always <laughs> sticks out to me more than anything else on those Sunday night productions. No, it's it's impossible to keep track of. But going back to like the actual thing, Rodney, you're you're a former player. You you know what right. it's like when someone's trying to get you got after a, a game. Why did he yeah. I don't know why he thought Chris Jones was gonna fall for that. It it, it was really it, like you gotta watch it because He's he's trying to go to him on, and then the question just gets disrespectful, and the whole thing falls apart. But it's like a radio know, it, question, right? It's it's a radio yeah. question. It's not a nationally televised right. question. Um, and because you know during the week, there was some Chiefs linebacker that was asked, um, "Hey, what do you think about the Jets' offense from what you've studied, and you know how Zach Wilson's performing?" And yeah. he put it in a way it looked like a team that wants to be able to run the ball. You know, that's <laughs> that's Coded. the nice way of Coded. saying it. Yeah. Coded. Just, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you can slip that through. Slip that through. You know, they got some big offensive linemen. They got Brees Hall, Dalvin Cook, whatever it's left of that. They look like a team that wants to run the ball. Now, Rodney, with no tax whatsoever. Well, th- th- come on. Don't you think the guy's trash? <laughs> yeah. But like, I can't say that right here, no. right now. <laughs> no, there's no upside. I actually just got dinged like 10 minutes ago and anyone that knows me, but like on Twitter, someone just said, you know, Nate, Nate Tice has got that kind of too nice going on. I don't think it's great for analysis. And it's like, that's because I'm on Twitter. I don't want to dog a guy unless I really like, I know this is a hundred percent not going to bite me in the ass. Like, it's just not worth it. Like it's like, yes. And once in a while I can maybe have a heat check of negativity, but it's like there, it's the nuance is not going to be there, and especially that's just like an NBC uh, show or a national production like that. It's like it's a different type of way you have to phrase everything. Everything is going to be all bubbly. Everything is going to be all nice and everything is going to be respectful. It's like, yeah, deep down, Chris Jones probably has some thoughts on Zach Wilson. OK, I understand the situation and the the downside of what could happen. What if Zach Wilson just has a good game the next game because everyone goes, wow, Chris Jones says he sucks. and It's just Chris Jones. So that that's again, that's the negativity of that. But no, it's a great call that like Harrison just like couldn't help himself. Just just went for, went for a check. Just went, and, went right shooting from the hip on the sideline. You know, I looked up this morning. I looked up because if you go on, on spot track and you, you go to any player's page, there's a a, a, a section for fines. So I looked oh. up. It, he, he only got His fined probably, four times. Only four. Oh, times. Only four. Yeah. I remember one. He had, uh, he had the he had bumping to a ref was one and then the big okay. one was you know uh peds where he oh, got popped like right. 400 grand for that yeah i forgot about the PED stuff i mean no. he lost almost a million dollars in fines of those four but still like i, I was it, surprised he made it worth it yeah <laughs> he's, he's got a good slugging percentage <laughs> yeah it's not bad but i was definitely surprised it's only four because i like my first thought when i hear rodney harrison's like yeah. I, I guy was a, a on the field. Especially in San Diego. That's <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I remember him. I felt like it was weekly he was getting them. Like because he was a headhunter too. I yeah. mean, I feel like that's also maybe it's like blending of memories that it's like, mm-hmm. oh well, today's rules. Oh, yeah, Ronnie Harrison probably got a bunch of them. It's like, well, they probably didn't call 95% of those back oh, in the yeah. day. Not so yet. it was, it was only the chance. it was only the X-rated ones that got called. Like it wasn't the ones that we would consider R-rated now. So yeah, it's oh, man, that's actually a that's a great little factoid. I would have guessed 10. Same. 10 would have been my number. Like Same. fines and suspensions. <laughs> this wouldn't be a podcast run by me if we didn't poke fun at what the saints are doing just a little bit it's all i have left right now uh <sighs> Derek carr went full guppy mode this weekend. full guppy mode full guppy mode and and you you kind of we all i feel like we kind of knew this was coming because when he hurt his shoulder last week <laughs> he was like he was crying you know like he was in hysterics so i was surprised that he even suited up this week this is the type of game to me that is the most frustrating to play like when you're a teammate of someone who just won't sit the hell down for a day, right. you know, because obviously Derek Carr has had his struggles, right? But he's better than 23 for 37, 127 yards, 3.4 yards in attempt. Like, come on, man. If you're going to do that, just sit down. Just sit. And it's probably because he sees Jameis and he's like, uh oh. Like, I don't want to give this up because Jameis is competent <laughs> enough. Like, Jameis is Jameis, but he's competent enough to take your job. Like, he, yeah. he can do that. It's not like uh, Matt McGloin back there as your backup. You know, it's not somebody that you never have to worry about every single day. So I feel like that's a little bit of it. But also, the injury that he had, and he left the game 
left the game, the Packers game. And like you said, I thought uh, last week in week three, and I thought it was like, oh, his separated his shoulder, like something like like brutal. And I was like, you kind of feel bad, like maybe a neck thing or something. And it was like AC joint sprain. And not going to like say like that doesn't suck, but it kind of, I don't know. <laughs> the, the There's the punishment doesn't fit the crime. The reaction doesn't fit the injury. I know that sounds mean. I've had it, but it does hurt. But it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Some the, that reaction didn't feel fitting. Um, no, we're we're gonna, good for some toxic masculinity over here. Everyone's yeah. Oh, smart, I know. You know. I know. Just uh, <laughs> me, big, tough guy over here. Uh, that's, uh, quarterback's literally the only position I could play in football because I was just like, I, I'm not a tackler. I'm not running anybody over. I'm a finesse guy, so let's play quarterback. But the the, the 127 yards on 37 attempts, and that's just when you watch that Saints offense. That's what it, it feels. Those stats feel like what you watch. Everything's checkdowns. Everything's underneath. Third down, he's throwing it short of the sticks over and over and over. Like Alex Smith has gone like, hey, man, got to push that ball a little bit. Like <laughs> <laughs> even, even he's probably dogging him a little bit on it. But that that offense, even when I love the firepower that they have, Alave and Thomas and Juwan Johnson and everything, the whole line's just in shambles. And Derek Carr is not his game is not dealing with pressure. It's clean pockets and picking you apart. So it's not a good start for what that team could potentially be, like to hit their upside, because O line and a banged up quarterback is usually gonna drag you down a little bit, no matter how good your defense is and no matter how good your pass catchers are. And it's interesting because the Saints have been a team I've almost always had a really good offensive line, you know, where, right. e- even going back to mid 2000s. I remember cursing the name of Jari Evans and Carl Banks, dude. Like they were so good. Yeah. So good. Uh, they not Carl Banks, me, Carl all Nix. the time. Carl Nix. Carl Banks is the old Giants linebacker. I'm too New York pilled sometimes. Carl Nix is what I meant to say. I, I actually <laughs> knew who you meant, but it was like, yeah. I was like, I was not, not my memory is not good enough with that, but I actually knew exactly who you meant. He, he, because they were so good and then you move on to um even like the second era where you you hit on guys like ryan ramschick um yeah and max unger was playing well before i think they or no did max Unger come to seattle or did they ship him they, they traded him they traded him and jimmy graham like okay yeah that's yeah. So right he that's came right. from that's seattle right. yeah but i mean so but they, they andres pete was pretty good for a couple of years he's not anymore uh their center mccoy like has played Armstead. well but he keeps getting injured and then i mean and then uh, C, C, uh steven's cousin uh, Cesar Ruiz, uh, he he's like he's played up and down. He's been playing better, but then Trevor Penning is like an absolute negative right now, and it's like and that's a high first round pick, and that's kind of, that's those are the ones that hurt. It's not yeah. some third rounder. It's like if you're taking a guy in the top fifteen or whatever, top twenty, that guy's got to be a dude or at least yeah. a good starter, and he looks like he's not even playable right now. Yeah, I remember on the the previous iteration of this podcast, I talked to your dad about offensive line prospects and. He took a fat dump all over Trevor Penning's tape. He, he was like, them. he's like, he's like, I don't get it. And I asked him, I was like, well, what do you make of someone being able to put up a combine like that, where you have like all time for an offensive lineman of his size? Yeah, the agility drills were crazy. The jumps crazy. The forty yard dash time crazy. But it doesn't actually. It's not conducive towards moving around and nope. actually being a tackle. And I asked him, I was like, well, what's up with that? He's like, I don't know. Some guys just don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple with his coaching sometimes. <laughs> it's it couldn't be many more opposite of what he likes because Penning had that kind of I would say he's fairly tough, but it's that fake toughness of like driving a guy down like 10 seconds. And my dad hates that. Shit. So it's like yeah. he he thinks that's so performative, and it is most of the time. And some guys really think that that's what blocking is. And most of the times blocking is just like a good shield. Like you just yeah. Nothing happened for three seconds. And that's what people don't understand sometimes. It's like, it's not a pancake. It's not always just this highlight. Like, good blocking is usually really boring. But yeah. pending, it was all highs and lows. And I feel like he wasn't big on – my dad was is not huge, huge on metric stuff. It's more just like, do you look at the part when you're moving? And, like, are you not a terrible athlete? But he's fine with, like, even baddish athletes. Uh, but yeah, that, I remember when we both watched Penning, I was like, I don't really like this guy, Dad. He goes, oh, he's terrible. And then I think he did the show with you. And I was like, yeah. OK, <laughs> right. he's letting it be known how exactly how he feels about Penning. Yeah. And, and, and going back to the Saints offense, like it just goes to to show like when you have a, a hurt quarterback behind a bad offensive line and, you, you know, Derek Carr, he's out there. He obviously shouldn't be out there. You end up in a game where Alvin Kamara, his first game back from suspension, 14 targets, 13 catches for 33 yards. Like, dude, what? What? How is that even possible? Najee Harris numbers. 
<laughs> like seriously. Yeah. Seriously, he have he have he averaged more yards per carry, 4.6 yards per carry than he did per catch, 2.5 yards per catch. And That's it remarkable. just goes like, why why are you why are we entertaining this? And and it's not even just a Saints question. I would extend that to the Bengals too, which I I kind of understand why the Bengals are doing it, right? Because if Jake Brown is your backup, ugh. There's only yeah. so much you can do. But Jameis yeah. is your backup here, Saints. Like you can you can afford to sit this thing down and wait to see if it gets better. Because look, I James might he might come out and throw for 150 yards and four interceptions, but he might come out and throw for 350 and four tutties, you know? Yes. And that's the kind of variance that you can use to survive when your quarterback's hurt. Just weird. Hey. And especially if your defense, then I think the Saints defense is at very at the very least pretty good and probably good. Like it's a good defense. And I think with the, when your offense, you know, that's not going to be the true strength of your team. I'd re- much rather either you either go super safe, but this is too safe or you have to go high variance. You have to go, hey, let's go. Let's get a bunch of touchdowns and big plays and we might have some turnovers. But guess what? We have a good defense that can balance that out. Uh, I think. I don't know. I think that's a more conducive plan. It's very rarely you see a player come down with 13 catches and complain about it after a game. But that's how right. you know it's bad. <laughs> Kamara yeah. coming out with 13 catches and going like something's got to change. And but I, I think with that Saints team is that they I, I'd rather go with Jameis, especially if Carr is not 100 percent healthy. Yes, Jameis. Jameis will stand in there. It doesn't matter what the pressure is. And I think with those playmakers, it's like you got to give them a shot to make plays because that is what's going to be better for this team because they're not their offensive line's not good enough to dink and dunk and matriculate down the field. It's got to be chunks. And I think that they have to kind of make a pivot in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And this just goes to show why you should be playing half point PPR instead of full point PPR. <laughs> great point though you know I, I i believe that i'm i'm all about half point well first off all about best ball now i'm all on oh, best ball so but good. half point ppr and one point for the for the tight ends to balance that out and we're we're good that is that yeah. is i am i am good with that from now on but that is yeah. a great point charles mcdonald <laughs> so, so just like just off of the the the, the passing game that's a that's a 16 point day from alvin kamara i yep. don't think so I don't think so. He they, had a he, 20, 20 point, 20 point day. Yeah. And he averaged two and a half yards a catch and yeah, and <laughs> at half 11 carries. PPR. Half one PPR. Now th- th- this is just a broader question as you know, we, we lead into kind of what happened last week and week four. Why are these quarterbacks playing hurt? Like, you know, as you're a former quarterback, I'm sure you can speak to the experience. Why yeah. do you think they're taking the field? I well, everyone's every team's different. All their team makeup. I think some of Burrow, it's a few things. I think he has a lot of pride. I think he Burrow is, is a competitor. Um, I think also he's like, no, I'm fine. So many players just say, oh no, I'm good, I'm good. But they're actually, and like you said, remember you're like, I have a teammate that I know he's not right, and he's kind of butchering the game for us, and you get annoyed. Like that could be part of it. It's like, hey, they're going to tell you they're fine, and it's like, what am I going to say to Burrow? Right. <laughs> what, right. you know the dude that just got paid a quarter billion like what What am i going to say to this guy and i think some of it too is the Bengals going like well at least for the Bengals case is well we we can you know hodgepodge this together he's still got the mind he still could be the operator and guess what no that's not working because you don't realize how much relies on him being that point guard i i think that's what it is i think they say he's fine those calf strains you will feel fine and then it pops and it hurts and then it hurts another again for a week. And then you feel fine. And then it hurts again. Like those, they never go away unless you get true rest. Um, I think, I think they're just trying to bandaid it until the, until the bye week. But it's like, I don't know. Are you making things worse? Uh, I mean, it's affecting the defense, obviously. How the defense played against the Titans was like, they didn't want to be there. Um, I wouldn't want to tackle Derrick Henry either, but still. Uh, but I, I think that's what a lot of their aspect is and i think burrow is just competitive and probably saying he's okay and i think the car thing is i joked about it but i think it's serious i think Derek is more going like well i gotta worry about Jameis," you know and i really do think that's real because yeah. Jameis is Jameis is Jameis again but he is competent enough to start so i think that's the difference i think it's burrow pride Bengals trying to get through it even if i don't endorse it i kind of sort of understand the angle but it's not working so it's just keep them healthy and sit them if they sat them right now and give them this first month you know, maybe at least you could have a chance for the next 12 weeks, 13 yeah. weeks. But now it's kind of like now it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. I think they're in a kind of a tough situation. No, but it does remind me of, of what happened with uh, Jamar Chase before the season started. And he said, you know, well, maybe he's, he, he kind of said, Burrow, first five weeks, maybe we won't have him. It kind of looks like that should have been the case. It should have been, <laughs> I think. At least, 
at least like wait at least two weeks and just say eat it maybe we can scrounge up a lucky game with a great game plan and it's like i don't know i think burrow's great but it like he's like 40 percent right now it's yeah. bad but they can't yeah. they, it's not operatable offense you just can't you can't play that way uh yeah. like he can't push anything down the field and you just throw him with no confidence and it's affecting the team yeah we'll we'll get to in a minute but clearly he's He's not healthy. And the dumbest thing that I see on social media now, oh, why ain't y'all got smoke for Joe Burrow? Because watch the game. He's hurt. Yeah. <laughs> what, what am I supposed That's to say? It. He's obviously great. <laughs> I know. I, we had on our pod, Roberts asked me, he's like, how, how would you go about fixing him? I was like, I don't know. Heal up Burrow's calf? Like, that's <laughs> it. There's no schematic thing here that I could break down. Sometimes it's as simple as somebody's calf muscle. <laughs> Get healthy. Get healthy. Get healthy. Um, all right. Let's move on to a, a broader week four recap. How much of the Toy Story broadcast did you see? A couple clips. The Bijan Juke. I saw the crane moving over. So I saw some stuff on Twitter, but then my wife like saw it on Twitter. She was at first was annoyed that I was watching football at 6:30 in the morning on West Coast time. But she took our son downstairs and she goes, she's like, babe, did you know there's a Toy Story broadcast? And I was like, Yeah. So I walked down there and I actually watched like two, three, four minutes of it. And she was loving it. Like she, she thought it was like the best thing ever. She's like, they're teaching you the game. And she's like, they're slinky dog. Like it's the first down marker. I actually thought the clips I saw, it was pretty cute. And I actually thought they were doing a good job of like trying to like introduce the game to people and like going about it in a fun way. It was creative. But uh, so I'll say five minutes. I'll say that that is my answer. Right. My, yeah. my longer, the short of it. Yeah. I, I tried to watch it you know, because I don't have ESPN plus, but I do have Disney plus. So. I, I was trying to watch something on my phone. I was, I was heading to the Bills game on Sunday morning. And I I got to say, I was impressed, honestly. I was impressed. I was too. I was also a little weirded out by how accurate some of the movements were with the animated characters on the field. Ritter like the looked one, exactly how Ritter looks like, yes, on the and, field. <laughs> and honestly, the one that blew me away was the pick six that he threw to Darius Williams where yeah. – yeah, I think, you know, in the real game, Darius Williams, like he's he's coming down hard. He gets a pick, runs it back. But like there's a point where Drake London's going for the ball and he kind of flails in the air and gets spun around a little bit. And then they show the Toy Story broadcast and he's mimicking the same exact animations that Derek Drake, like Drake London had trying to get that ball. It in the was game. pretty it was cool. A little, it was a little, there was like some voodoo stuff going on there. I don't know. There was, it was cool. The pick six was the one that stood out to me because Ritter threw it. And after he threw it, he went like this, like a lot of quarterbacks do. And then he started running. And then they, I watched that, the Pixar thing I saw on Twitter somewhere. And it looked, he ran, the animated Ritter that would just threw a pick six looked like the real Ritter that just threw a pick six yes, <laughs> as far as yes. his hands and, and like the running motion. I was like, that is cool. Like, yeah. I didn't, again, I didn't know they could do it. I, I just like the slinky dog as the first down marker was hilarious to me. Like, cause when a penalty would happen, his butt would just move back five yards. And I was like, that is nice job. Nice they, job. These Disney people know what they're doing. They, yeah, <laughs> so they, they it's, do some good work. They know how to make a buck. Yeah, so I watched a few minutes of it. It was cool. I, I think people were a little too hard on it. For the first try, that was pretty they good. They were hard on it? It's it, Yeah. It's, you got you to gotta know what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, dude, they, they, they did that off of, like, chips in the shoulder pads. and I don't yeah. know. I think it's pretty impressive. Like, the sign fire is pretty impressive. I agree. Um, I because. Yeah. The, that tech, even without the Toy Story kind of UI, is like you could do really cool stuff. Like like you, the wheels start start turning, and I think mm-hmm. that's what's really cool about what can happen with down the road with this stuff. Right. You you start off with a little low risk things, things that kids are going to watch, and yep. people are a little impressed. And you move on. Now no you one will get mad at you. Like, right. Smiles <laughs> and balloons everywhere. No one gets mad at it. This you can still not... watch a real broadcast if this yes. goes out. You know. <laughs> yes. Until we get to AI football in the future, and then, then we don't have to worry about concussions anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Before we get to the ad break, let's turn it back to Sunday Night Football. The Jets are having a tough time this season, but this is something oh, that we, I know we talked about. <laughs> a little bit of a tough time. This is something that we talked about. Um, you know, I think yesterday, um, you know, as, as people were reeling from the the ending of that game, the Jermaine Johnson holding call that has people furious on Twitter. And look, I play defensive line. I sympathize with defensive linemen. But there's a reason why when your defensive line coach will teach you, if you want to draw that hold, you got to do something. You, you got to do something. You got to do something, whether it doesn't even have to be a full on move, just something where you can get the offensive linemen's right. Try and pull away so that the official will see, oh, he's like really yanking on. They're never, ever going to call it 
if the hands are, you know, inside the shoulder pads or just outside the shoulder pads, not to victim blame, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, (laughs) you got to do something. You got to make a move that's going to show clear hand in jersey to an official that is also trying to look out for other things they're in a play too. You got to make it clear and obvious. You got to make it a thing. You got to make a show of it, like however you want to do it. Like if, especially if you're not directly at that ball, like, yes, the ball went by him, but Mm -hmm. when quote unquote, the holding's happening, he's complaining, you know, he's throwing his hands up, but it just looks like it it was uh, Smith, right? It it was uh, Donovan Smith. Donovan Smith. To me as an offensive guy, I'm like, Oh, he's kicking his ass. Like, cause he's like, he's latched lit. That, that is legal. If you are inside the shoulder pads and can grab them like that, that since 1978 or 1977, when they changed those rules, that is legal. So it, as long as you're not pulling away and trying to make a play, refs aren't going to call it. So that's no. the thing. You can't just complain and throw your hands up. They're not going to call that. But if you pull and try to make a move and then that's when you get the call. So yeah. I understand the no call, even if yes, technically it looks like holding, to the refs, that does not look like holding, and technically, it's not holding. So it's kind of yeah. yeah Got to make it. Got to make a move. Got to make a move. Got to make a move. You know, I remember we had one of my coaches, freshman year in college. He's he. It's funny. He best best defensive line coach I ever had, and he was in a wheelchair. Like the guy was he was brilliant, and he would say, "Well, if you're gonna complain, you might as well just make a rip. You know, your your arms are already up. Now just rip yep. across if you're gonna cry about it. And there's your flag right there. Yeah. So, and, and look. Jermaine knows that. He just probably got caught up with the emotion of the play because I don't think that I know more than the Jets defensive line coach. I don't think that they're, that's not something to be instructed on. But I understand also, you know, in the moment when you feel someone who's much stronger than you holding on to you, it can be a little disorienting. Well, hopeless. A little I've, hopeless. I've had, even though I was a quarterback, I played some special teams uh, at Wisconsin because they're just like, we got to get some use out of you. You're tall and can run a little bit. And, uh, there's first time I was like, man, I feel pretty good about myself. And I was like running down on kickoff. I'm running on punt and stuff like that. I'm like, this is pretty good. And then a linebacker latched onto me, a Wisconsin linebacker. His name was Mike Taylor. And I've never felt more hopeless in my entire life. It was like, oh, yeah, I'm a quarterback 220. I'm quarterback strong. This is a former all-state wrestler at Wisconsin that like played in the NFL and was like a all, all, uh, pro, all Big Ten linebacker. And he latched onto me. I honestly couldn't move. Like, I've never felt so at 230 pounds. I've never felt so hopeless to have a guy just control me like that, like with his hands. And he was like, you're going here. I was like, OK, I'm going here. But that's 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 what's crazy about the NFL. It's probably Jermaine oh, Johnson. Jermaine Johnson's probably like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this what doesn't this? happen. <laughs> this guy who's like a, a, a has been, you know, tr- was basically kicked out of uh, Tampa Bay for all these uh, false starts and holding penalties and you know really tanking this play after that contract extension. It's got me in a figure four, dude. Figure yes. four. Uh, <laughs> dude, I, that, that just reminds me of my freshman year, Gettysburg. We played uh, Johns Hopkins, who's a, who was a, they were a really good Division three uh, yeah. football program, and they had a left tackle who was like a borderline. NFL prospect, like not even a priority UDFA, like just literally a, maybe a camp body. But in D3, that's like. In D3, dude. Like, <laughs> that's God. <laughs> so I mean, we, we, when, I, when I went against him, because I, I, I play, I split time into a defensive tackle and defensive end. And, you know, there's a play where I'm playing three technique and I'm trying to get up the field. And all of, a fun, all of a sudden, it felt like, dude, I had Kratos on my back from God of War, like just washing me. 20 yards down the line of scrimmage. Like I, I went from <laughs> sideline to sideline on the back of this guy who couldn't even sniff an NFL roster. And that's when I was like, whoa, whoa, this is, yep. this is a, this is a different little, uh, this is a different game that that guy's playing compared to what I'm playing. I think that's why I knew I limited my own NFL aspirations was because every day I was around Dante Culpepper and Gus Farratt and even Sean Hill and even and Brad Johnson. And I watched not only like guys like Sean Hill and Brad Johnson put every freaking throw on the money within 20 yards, like not even like breaking a sweat. And then watching Dante Culpepper and Gus Farrat throw it like 70, 75 yards. I legit saw Culpepper throw it 60 yards off his knees and I'm in high school and I'm like barely touching 45 yards. And I'm like, I'm not an NFL quarterback. <laughs> it's like, oh, obviously I got stronger and bigger and everything. And I could actually throw it pretty decently. But it's like, that's the thing. It's like, once you get around those NFL guys, they do things that you don't even think are fathomable and they do it consistently. And it's, yeah, that that's that's the difference sometimes with uh, speed and strength at, at that level. Yeah. Last thing before we get to an ad break. Speaking of things that are kind of unfathomable, 
Uh, Aaron Rodgers keeps saying he's going to come back this season. <laughs> come on. Come on. How, At this they, point, for what? For what? It's like seven <laughs> different surgeons they've talked about, right? Like that, that he's going to get on. on the Achilles. Dolphin sex noises. Aaron, come on. Just take it easy. Come back next year. Yeah. And you know, we'll see what's going on. Just got their got first round mind. pick. You're not playing. So it's yeah. great. It's great. Yeah, you're it's going to be playing. better next year. It'll be even better. Gonna, Maybe they, we'll get some They linemen. might get you Marvin Harrison Jr., bro. Maybe. Right. Or uh, one of the awesome left tackles in next year's draft. It could be really good. Could be a good could thing. Be really, could be good. <laughs> Sit down, Aaron. All right. We will be right back to you after a quick word from our sponsors. All right, we are back, and we're changing professions for this little segment. I am Dr. Football, joined by my friend who is also named Dr. Football. And today, <laughs> not related. Not related. Not related. No relation. Uh, today, we're going to picking out five offenses just to kind of diagnose and see if there's anything that they can fix before the season's over. Some of these teams are in much worse situations than others. You know, we're going to talk about the Dolphins at some point. We're also going to talk about the Giants. And I think just after that Monday night game last night, it's a good place to start off. Daniel Jones got sacked 10 times. <laughs> I know they have a backup left tackle in. Andrew Thomas is hurt right now. But this is the second game that we've seen where, where Daniel Jones has either hit double digit sacks or approaching double digit sacks because he got sacked eight times against Dallas to start the season. Is there anything that the Giants can do to kind of turn this around? <laughs> because I, I think one of their biggest issues this year going into the off season is they just kind of overrated what they what they had they overplayed their hand yeah overplayed their hands exactly right i felt like it, it feels like the vibes of this team is backwards it felt like what how last year happened is how should this year should be going oh sneaky competitive oh they're well coached oh daniel jones is playing some clean ball and then this year feels like how they should have felt last year oh andrew we got nothing out of andrew thomas evan neal looks like you know, not not looking great at the right on the right side. And uh, OK, they made a trade for Isaiah Simmons, you know, just the random stuff that they've been doing this offseason. And and oh, OK, we're going to bring Saquon back on a one year deal. Like it felt like this year feels like the first year. It was almost like they I feel like it's good to make the playoffs and buy yourself some time, especially mm. with any ownership. But it also now just feels like expectations, even though there I feel like there shouldn't be with this Giants team because they're so incomplete. They have so much. They, I think I agree with you. First off, is that not sure where the upside is. Even last right. year, this offense was gum and toothpicks. It was Saquon, it was Burita running pony personnel and doing all this funky stuff, and then it was like Daniel Jones running like bootlegs, play action, and one read play pass uh, dropbacks. What they were doing is limiting the menu for Daniel Jones and limiting where his eyes go and just get rid of the ball. This year, it feels like they kind of were like, "Ooh, it's add to that." But ooh, we got we can do this. We did this last year, Daniel. They're onto it, and now that's it's without the offensive line playing okay, without any easy buttons. It feels like, and without right. like anyone making really any plays. I know Saquon, Saquon, but it's like who else is stepping up for this team? <laughs> like they, they got well, a couple I thought of days. Darren Waller was was for Darren you Waller, know? Um, uh, Jalen Hyatt, who's been banged up. I know, but like even Wendell Robinson who's coming back from an injury. But I mean, those are day two guys. That's Darren Waller. Like those guys are supposed to be like tangible players. And it just doesn't feel like they have any tangible dudes on really offense or defense, defensive line. They have some cool guys, you know, Dexter, uh, Dexter Lawrence and everything. I don't know. Deontay Banks looks good, but I feel like offensively, it's just like it's, they have no juice. And Daniel yeah. Jones is kind of it takes too long to operate. Um, that's just how he is. It's it's a feature, not a bug. Or I guess it is a bug too. But it's just that, <laughs> that <laughs> I, that's just how he operates. He takes a minute, he takes some time. And so yeah, they they need Bar Saquon back just to give them a, a little lifted floor to make their life a little easier somehow. Yeah, and I think this is some of the concern that at least, you know, a lot of people had about this roster coming into the season is you guys have some good players. Like they really do have some good players, but they don't have that many. And when it starts right. to starts to dock off, like their Andrew best players Thomas, are the left tackle and defensive tackle. Like and the running back. And the running back. Two you know, which are gone. <laughs> it's not quarterback and uh, Dexter Warren's going to have to pass her, but it's not a bendy pass rusher quarterback and a pass catcher. You know, it's just, it's the different right. makeup of this team. Right. And then when you lose Andrew Thomas, you lose Saquon Barkley. And not only that, they, they really have struggled. And I know it's tough for all teams, but they really struggle to have building like offensive line depth. Um, and I think you saw that. I, I felt, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really find myself uh, feeling bad for professional football players often, but 
I will say that performance from Josh Azudu last night at left tackle, I was like, dude, like, it I, I, there's just no chance. He has no chance out here. And yeah. I just, sometimes I wonder, like, it's not your fault, man. You're just, you're just not supposed to be here. <laughs> right. Right. No one, you didn't ask to be here. Right. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was drafted as a guard, you know, yeah. and now he's playing left tackle, which is, it, it usually goes oh. the other way around. Not, not guard to left tackle. <laughs> this is the usual transition you make, the the usual bump out. It's usually bump in for a reason. Uh no, it's and that's what that's what stinks, especially when the game script gets out of hand and that you have to start chasing points. And so it's like when you're playing with backups, you just want to keep it tight. Okay, so we can run the ball, we can do these conservative passes. And it's like once the game script gets out of hand, it's just that downward spiral. We've seen it yeah. a million times. The, it always feels like it's a national game too. It's never it can never just happen a, a one o'clock game on Sunday. It's always got to be Sunday night, Monday night, or Thursday night when an offensive line just falls apart. My dad's offensive lines with the Bears. This happened to him against the Giants. Actually, I think he gave they gave up eight sacks, and then I think the 49ers, they gave up seven sacks. I think both were Monday night games. It was just like why those games? Why why not a Sunday no- noon game that you just get through this and no one cares? But yeah. uh, that that's what happens when you have a quarterback that holds onto the ball a little bit an offensive scheme that they don't have a lot of answers, especially with Barkley out and they just don't have a lot of juice. And then you got backup offensive linemen going against, you know, a pretty good pass rush. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Before we move on, it's like, there's nothing, there's no help coming to save the giants either. No. Cause they go to Miami. Then they go to Buffalo. Then they play the commanders. Then they play the jets. Like none of those games are explicitly winnable for them. We have wink versus the Miami Dolphins defense or offense. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's uh styles make fights, and that's gonna be an interesting style. It's gonna be an interesting fights. one. It's gonna be an interesting gonna, one. Haymakers versus haymakers <laughs> get thrown <laughs> in that game. <laughs> well, hopefully the Giants can throw some haymakers back because I feel pretty comfortable that that's gonna be a pretty huge day for the Miami Dolphins offense. I, I think so too. Although yeah. Dante Banks played well last night. I will say that he for did. Giants fans. Rookie yeah. quarter. He, he played well. So you got some glimmers of hope coming coming down, but maybe not offensively. Let's spend a couple seconds on the Steelers, only because I do find it funny that <laughs> there's so much hype about this team in the offseason. And I felt so gaslit watching all of this happen. So like the, gaslit. The, the Falcons game, the last preseason game they had against the Falcons, right? The Falcons, they didn't have a starter in. They didn't have a second string guy in. No. The only guy who was like playing, who who was playing in that game that's playing on the real defense is rookie defensive end Ohio or Zach Harrison from Ohio State. Right. That's because you're going to get your rookie reps. Third rounder, like, get some reps, you know. Right. Keep keep, keep the blood pumping, get, get some experience. But of course, I would hope that Kenny Pickett and George Pickens and Deontay Johnson could light up an offense, a defense filled with guys who aren't even going to make the team. Right. And for, for people to extrapolate that into the regular season, it made no sense. It just made no sense at all. Um, I don't I don't I, I think, you know, of the of the teams that we're going to get to the Giants and the Steelers have the bleakest feel to me, because with the Steelers, your your problem is to me, I think their biggest problem is at quarterback. You know, you want to complain about Matt Canada all you want, but it, it, it I don't really know how many offensive coordinators would be successful with. Kenny Pickett as a quarterback, especially right now. Yeah, right. it's he's Pickett's big thing was okay. He can create and everything. He how he got typecasted was very uh, very lazy. I, I thought from a lot of analysts where I I heard Burrow comparisons coming from some people. Uh, Pickett's got a pretty good arm. Pickett's a good athlete. Pickett does not process very well. That is his kind of his good and bad is he can create a little bit but he is not going to go one to two to three and sit in the pocket and be calm he is a chaotic player by nature it's why i compared him to taylor heineke which is and i stand by it <laughs> um but the, i oh man i got gaslit so bad by the Steelers stuff uh more so because it was just i believed in the defense and then you know some underlying metrics so last year i was like okay the offense did improve and then i, I was i all offseason i'm like i'm gonna make a big project i'm gonna rewatch that Steelers offense second half of the year i watched four games Still sucked. It just was like the it just the run game got a little bit better. And I just ah I was like, you know, Tom went, okay, maybe their offense could be like 18th best and the defense is like top eight. And it's just, yeah. I mean, we see this and it's like, no, this is what this offense looks like. You got Matt Canada is not helping, of course, but you know, quarterbacks can make things right. And and that's where it's the worst of two worlds right now. 
Pickett's chaotic. Pickett is late on throws and Canada's not kind of giving him any easy, easy buttons to help out. Like this offense is so funny because everyone's on islands when they motion, then you know, it's a run because they don't motion on passes. So right there, good defenses could just tee off on oh, it. Right, right. Tee off. Oh, they're not. Oh, they're static. Pass, pass. All right, here we go. Here we go. Go, boo, let's go. And I think with Pickett right now, it's that like he has no confidence in what's being called, no confidence in his own play, just simple stuff like a slant route he's laid on. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I just it, it feels again, we're talking about downward spirals, but there's more. It feels like it just doesn't feel like they have a way to operate through throwing the ball. And right now, the run game is just really sloppy, which is exactly what happened last year. So I want to know what the hell is going on in these meetings, because no one feels like they're on the same page. And I'm kind of disappointed in being gaslit kind of sort of because a couple of people went to their practices and were like oh pick it can really wing it and right like, yeah, yeah okay okay we'll yeah. see and i feel ghastly because they they put up yeah a perfect passer rating against you know the guys that weren't even going to make the falcons i don't know it's it, 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 are you saying it's are annoying. you saying people overhype preseason performances wow. does that happen it never really <laughs> happened but i guess it did happen this one time this hmm. just once it's only, uh, only time it's ever going to happen. Remember the the all timer. No, there's two all timers for preseason hype. Chip Kelly against the Packers, and Chip Kelly actually was fine in the NFL, but against the Packers, like week one or week two of the preseason, Packers were running like the same coverage every single play, and Chip Kelly just went off on it. It was just like having a field day, just running tempo, doing all this stuff. And then the freaking what's his name, Freddie Kitchens Browns. Week mm. one preseason, they came out no huddle with Baker Mayfield and just were going empty and just winging it. Everyone's like, this Browns offense is going to set records. Everyone hyped it up. And it was like, that was just the season from hell for the Browns. But sorry, preseason yeah. hype uh, remains defeated, not undefeated. It remains defeated. <laughs> preseason <laughs> hype remains defeated. Yeah. It, it just feels like some of these teams have made some weird quarterback investments recently. I saw some Steelers fan on the internet yesterday calling the Kenny Pickett pick like the Steelers chance of the Disney movie because he went to Pittsburgh. And honestly, I think there's reason to believe if he didn't go to Pittsburgh, they might not have picked him. I don't know. I, I kind of believe that too. And I think Canada recruited him to Pitt. So uh, I think there is some of that going on. Uh, when yeah. that, that, ma- that pairing happened. Dude, and also yesterday that, that Texas Steelers game, it was like, okay, Look, the Texans, their defense is still a work in progress, I think, just in terms of building out the personnel. But D'Amico versus Matt Canada, that looked like how it was supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. It looked like one of the, the top defensive minds in the NFL versus a guy that gets lambasted every single week. But again, that's you. it's always encouraging or to like my own heart and brain that it's like, okay, it looks how I thought it would look. <laughs> like yes. how that Texas defense is playing against that Steelers offense. Not where it's like, man, am I wrong? Am I wrong? Like, am I watching the wrong things? It's like, no, no, that's exactly how it should have unfolded. It's the kids who are wrong. <laughs> it's the kids who are wrong. Um, My entire life. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think one one last thing a little on the Steelers before we move on. Broderick Jones basically got his first real game yesterday. We'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I, I got to watch there. it. I, yeah, he had a couple of rough reps, but I got, I knew he was going to be a work in progress, but we right. got to keep he's watching. He's young. He's, he's young. young and he's a guy like I think when you just look at him, his body's gotta develop some more before. Yep. Especially lower body. Yep. No, that's right. exactly it. I I that was my MO with Jones. Liked him a lot, understood why people liked him, but I had him a little lower because I thought he would take some time and that's that's probably how it's gonna go. Yep. So we'll see how that progresses throughout uh the rest of the season. Now let's talk about, you know, maybe some teams that have some more hope. And we talked about the Bengals earlier, and obviously the the Joe Burrow injury is it's the big driving force for why they suck right now. But I also think the Joe Burrow thing is putting them in a spot that is really not conducive for the type of offensive linemen that they have. Right. You know, if you're going to be a 94 percent shotgun team, your left tackle can't be Orlando Brown. No, it, it no. can't be. You know, so it's not it's not just like that. Joe Burrow's offense, Joe, Joe Burrow's injury, excuse me, is hampering the offense. It's accentuating all the weaknesses that this offense has because they're just not meant to be a team that's in shotgun as much as they are. And I almost wonder, like, yeah, if you were to bench Joe Burrow, just say get ready, get healed for for Jake Browning, you lose a lot in terms of just like functional quarterback play. But maybe if you can just get under center some more, does that help you just maybe maybe the output's the same. 
but yeah. maybe it's an idea just to ponder. I think it'll help a little bit. With, it would, would. I actually do think that would help like a little bit with like the run game and maybe just getting some because they don't run any like bootlegs or play action, which is an easy button that that mm-hmm. the offenses can get to. They don't run them at all because they have Burrow, <laughs> which is that Burrow sit there and pick part defenses. Like, we don't need motion. They're also like the team that uses motion the least. I think they have the most static formations, the mo- like widest formations because they have T Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tower Boyd. Let's put them on islands and let's have Joe, Bo- Joe Burrow find them one on one and dissect it. So now this offense that doesn't really use rpos they did a little bit more last year doesn't use bootlegs doesn't use screens that much all these things they have to like add on the fly and so really it's on the coaches and everything i agree with you about the under center stuff uh like if they did with go with browning but also like orlando brown like i understood in the sense that it's like the Bengals' run game was very efficient last year and that would help burrow mitigates his pass rush because burrow can move in the pocket really well not and that ain't, that ain't happening now. Right. <laughs> they ain't have. They actually would have made more sense to get Donovan Smith than Orlando Brown. Like that actually for how they played, that actually would a buy low candidate would have been perfect for them. But yeah, I agree with you that that even the, like the Irv Smith signing, people are like trying to hype that up, and I was like, I don't know. But like that he's again is yeah, he's a pass. I don't know, but but again too is that's going to limit some of the stuff you can get to if you want to like revamp this offense, like and get under center and run the ball. So they're they're in a hard place. This is why, this is, this is why you you don't practice. F- uh, I mean, this is this is why because right. this is what it, this is what unfolds when you have to totally remodel your entire offense. But that's what the Burrow injury is going to do to them. Yeah, I, I just kind of wonder if they if they feel themselves getting to a breaking point here, maybe I, I don't, I don't, you, you just signed them to uh, what, the $250 million contract. Basically, you know, that's basically the floor of it. Uh, why, why not just, you, you're playing for longer than this season. I know that correct. this core, the clock might be ticking on yeah. their, the current setup that they have, but in general, you got to protect your investment to degree. You got to protect from himself. Um, it's, and there's your four the, 14, not, you're four of four, you know, right. I, I get what you're saying there. Sorry to cut you off. Right. But, you know, maybe they can get into the buy. They have games against the Cardinals and the Seahawks. Maybe they can get into the buy at two and four. But still, you know, you've you've tanked most of your season at that yeah. point. And look at the division. Yeah. It's I know. And it's the AFC and overall it's just got there's so many good teams. And then there, now there's frisky teams like the Texans and the Titans and the Colts. Like, so it's not. You know, it's not a lot of easy buckets <laughs> that conference, yeah. and the, the Browns aren't going to be playing DTR every week. You know, yeah. it's... <laughs> right? <laughs> Ravens are going to Ravens are actually going to get healthier. Like the that, Ravens, reinfor- the reinforcements are coming. They're they're leading the division, one of the toughest divisions right now. Like what the what the hell? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. And I I think they're also there's also just like the real psychological side of it like is our season already over white like, flagging it gonna, right yeah. are we going to white flag it the first week of october right that's right or, or it's, it's, it's better than the, at least you know at least they got more than four plays <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point that's a good point four <laughs> plays and the extinguishment of excitement for an entire like tri-state area oh my god uh, at that's least, tough. at least that didn't happen on national TV after an entire six months of hype. <laughs> yeah, and this, at least they didn't have fireworks before the day of the game. And, were you there? You know, you, were you I live? Was there? Oh, that's I was, right. I, I figured you I were. Was at the Rogers. What was Bills the sound game, like? Like, uh, not the the Achilles, obviously, but the sound of the the lack of sound at the stadium. Was it uh, just there was like, no? I would say there was no sound at all. Oh, and the, like, you, there's you nothing could, like that sound, man. It that went lack from a fireworks show to nothing. Like he ran out with the American nothing. flag. Yes. That was, yes. Yeah. I thought oh. he was gonna, you know, throw it down at midfield like the like Renegade man does. Like yes. a Florida State <laughs> Renegade? <laughs> yes. Uh, it's crazy. Oh my God. So real quick, the the Renegade thing reminds me. Uh right before I got to Wisconsin, they uh they played in the Outback Bowl against Florida State. And Wisconsin was like seven and six. It was not a good year that year. And actually I got in right at the right time because they like revamped how they practiced and everything, and we ripped off a couple good seasons. So I get there and Scott Tolzien is telling me a story uh, about the quarterback that was starting that year. His name was Dustin Shear. And they were competing for the job all bowl game. And Dustin Shear got in. Scotty is a great storyteller. He's just like, oh, you know, like I'm disappointed, but I'm going to be a good teammate and everything. And all of a sudden we're playing Florida State. It's at the Outback or uh, at the Champs Bowl. I'm sorry. I think it was in Orlando or Outback Bowl in Tampa. It's in Florida. And 
oh, you know, the, the chant's going on, everything's going on. And he says, Renegade comes out and that spear is flaming and spikes it right in front of us. And Scotty goes, all right, Dustin, you got it, buddy. And just slapped him in the butt. But he was just like, he said, as soon as he saw that, he was like, yeah, I don't want this game. I'm good. I'll wait for next year to start. <laughs> we don't want that. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good on all that. All right. Well, before we get out of here, we got two teams left. This is where we're, we'll get into the Falcons talk right here. Okay. I'm spoiled. Like, as we talked about at the start of the show, I have realized this year how spoiled I have been for the basically the past 20 years of fandom. You know, getting growing up with Michael Vick, and then you only spend one year where things are bad, and you're right back in with Matt Ryan. His first touchdown pass is like a 65-yard touchdown. First, first pass first was pass. a 60-yard touchdown. Yes, 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 yes. And you make yes. the playoffs right away. <laughs> right, right. You have a good offense. You go from like laughing stock to a good offense within yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, and now we're, you know, 15 years removed from Matt Ryan getting drafted, which is crazy. Crazy. Because I remember Makes exactly. Feel, huh? Yeah, it does. Because I've seen, you know, his whole career pretty much. And it, it, it it's kind of wild to think that, that was 15 years ago. But now we're in, we're looking for the next quarterback phase. I, you know, it, during the games, I find myself being like so disgusted during the games because like, oh my God, like this is, I'm just not used to, to, to struggling on offense like they are. But then last night, I kind of went back and I watched some of the, the cut-ups. I don't think it's like... It's not as bad. As, it, as it's I not thought. pure disaster mode no. as as I thought. It's not. It's not. I, I just need I, Desmond to throw the ball sometimes. Dude, so this is how he was in college. He is a terrible... I would say terrible, but he is not a good first quarter quarterback. And then he gets hit a couple times and then he's fine. And then he does everything right. It's... I, I truly think he galaxy brains himself early on games. He's like, rather than just the choice route, I know you just rewatched it. So the choice route, third down, he takes a sack. Yeah. Just throw it. He's looking just at it. it. I've just seen throw him throw it. it. Just throw it. And I think he truly galaxy brains himself where he's like, they might be on to it. So I'm going to get to the second read. And it's like, nope, just take the first read. That's why it's number one. That's why right. it's called the primary Desmond. And I actually thought he actually had some good throws as the game went along. And, I, and I'm not going to tweet this because I know people just come after me and say, oh, you defend him. You do all this. I actually I'm with you. I came away from rewatching that game. I actually was like, I'm kind of I've sold a like I would say I've sold stock. I had them as like a top five, top six offense, but I still think they could be a top 10 offense. I still believe it. I can't it's, believe I'm saying that. It's still that. there. It's, it's still, still there. there. There's so many chances to be had. You said that. There's so many chances to be had. And I think they're going to get there. I think they go yeah. to Galaxy Brain to start the games. And they're one of the best. I, I looked it up before we came on. Um, they're a top, I think they're eighth in EPA per play in the second half. And they're like 11th in success rate. And they and how that's how all those games have felt. The Packers game. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Panthers game a little bit, but then, you know, the, uh, the, even the loss against the Lions, they had a couple of good drives. And then the last three quarters against the Jags, they were putting together some nice drives. You just don't throw a freaking pick six on slant flat. And it's a totally different game. So yeah. a couple, I, I thought it was just a couple errors that really just got expounded. And uh, I, yeah, I felt better about them than I even thought I was ready to really lash into them this week, but actually I'm like, nope, I'm still just, I'm, I'm holding steady for at least for now. Yeah. I think, I, I think, you know, watching the game, especially early in the game, like you said, there's two plays that kind of stood out to me from Ritter where I think it's, one of them was on the first drive where it's like a first and 10, they run a little slant flat and the flats open and he looks at it and he double pumps and he doesn't throw it. I'm like, dude, just take the just four yards. Just throw it. Take the four yards. Look, the guy's going to get tackled pretty shortly after making the catch. But if you can get four or five yards in the first down, you got, you got B. John Robinson back there. Second five is not a bad spot to be in. And then there was another one where, you know, he throws the post, to Drake London. Yeah. And, and Pitts is running wide Pitts open is, on the Pitts is wide open on the crosser. I'm like, dude, come on. You you, you know, know better than to throw that post route. You know what's so annoying about that too is his second pick right after. So he had the pick six and he followed up immediately with another it's pick. Like, yeah. They ran that same play and he tries to throw Pitts because he's like, oh, that guy was open last time. So let's get back to it. I guarantee they're on the sideline. Let's get back to that one. That's going to be wide open. And so the safety just uh, Cisco or whatever just drives on it. And it's like, oh, that it's like football's really hard. And football's it's really, really hard. It's, it's really annoying really sometimes because you're like, oh, it's going to be wide open again. Right. No, I throw a pick on it. It's not even incomplete. It's a pick. Um, and then also the slant flat pick six. Drake London ran like the worst slant route I've ever seen in my that was life. Bad. He, he almost ran like a dig. Yeah, it was like he like looped it. It was really weird, but that have it's 
this is why every play is, is sometimes it's not just one person's fault. It's multiple people's fault is London runs a bad route there, but this is where you're the quarterback. You got to make the play right. He runs right. a wrong route. Come off of it. Get off of it. And slant flat. You can even see it on this play. Algier is sitting over the middle of the ball as a check down. Uh, Paul Christ is, is really good at this. That's why he, he used to be the head coach of Wisconsin. He was my offense coordinator at Wisconsin is that let your feet tell you it's wrong. So it's like, as soon as Desmond doesn't want to throw it, you can tell he's like, ah, as soon as you get that feeling, check it down, just throw a check down five yards. That's the Philip Rivers line of thinking that Philip Rivers made a whole career off of doing it like that. So just those little small things. It's just like, just avoid those catastrophic mistakes. And man, this offense will be cooking. We're close. We're, We're close. close. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I just need, there's a lot of late. I still feel I mean, when I watch this tape, I watch the Falcons game. It, it, it kind of hurts my brain. Like when I take off my fandom hat and I watch the game as an analyst and I see people, oh, Arthur Smith can't design a pass game. It's Dude, opposite. it's there, bro. It's, it's there. Opposite. Just there's throw guys. the ball. Yep. There's guys. <laughs> I, I, I've only maybe seen two plays this whole year where I'm like, ooh, what was that? Everything is sound. There's a guy wide open on every play. It's yeah. No, Arthur Smith is doing a mighty fine job right now. Almost too good of a job. I think first quarter, I think they have, they want to run 50 different plays. And it's like, right. just, just limit. That's why they get better is because they throw off plays that aren't working and then they narrow it down. Just let's start a little narrower. So and I think narrow. that, that will help them yeah. out. Yeah. So look, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm actually, I don't, I don't know if it's going to go well for the Falcons, but I am actually pretty interested to see Arthur versus D'Amico. Yeah. Um, next week. That's, That's a good fun. one. That's and good hopefully one. Falcons fans don't throw up if CJ Stroud has a good game. So <laughs> Stroud's the truth, though. Yeah, I might do sweet. a little I might do a little, you know, in mouth vomiting. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, nice test for that. Uh yeah, the Falcons offense is like top five. And then here comes here comes the real comes, doctor. Yeah, Stroud just real, slicing yeah. and dicing every defense he's playing right now. Yeah. But it's okay because we're gonna trade first round four first round picks for Kyler Murray. Or yeah, I called. I got called stupid for this yesterday. I was like, dude, if this keeps going how it's going, at least they can get the Panthers pick from Chicago. Maybe it's someone's like, oh, glad you aren't the GM. It's like you, we need quarterbacks. <laughs> yes. We 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 were all flash no substance. That's my Falcons that I know. Now we're just no flash no substance. <laughs> Give me my flash. Give just me a little flash. sizzle. Just a little, a little sizzle. sizzle. Speaking That's of teams, you speaking of teams, I had a little sizzle. Dolphins. Look, this is. Probably the most fixable. I would say this is easily the most fixable, right, of the offenses that we've seen. I wouldn't even say that this is like uh, the Dolphins offense needs to be fixed or anything because they just scored 70 points and they were good against Buffalo until they hit a point where they had to start drop back passing, right? And you kind of lose the element of some of what makes the Dolphins offense great when you're you're down two scores. And teams like, okay, the Bills were just like, well, fine. We'll, we're just going to tee off. If we get gashed in the run game by a Chan every once in a while, that's fine. But we're not going to let Tyreek Hill beat us. We're not going to let Jalen Wallow beat us. And then when, when Teron Armstead went out on the injury and he got replaced by Kendall Lamb, that's where you got to see where some of the criticisms for Tua come in, where it's like, bro, if you, you need to make a play by your damn self sometimes. And it just, it looks hard for him when the bodies start getting close, the pocket gets congested, and you can see, oh, he's not a guy that can just fire a dart to the outside like Josh Allen can, or even run and make a play like some of these other quarterbacks can really all the time. You know, he's a good for, you know, a little six, seven yard scramble, but when it's time to be a generator of offense, I thought that that's where he kind of struggled this past week. And and that's where the athleticism, the arm talent, wait, wait, people just think, oh, the arm talent, it's like, oh, he wants to throw it 80 yards. It's the room for error that gives you. And and there's one play that I think of is uh, Tiger Kill try to like toe tap one on the sideline and end up being out of bounds. On that play, the Bills cover it wonderfully. They they their flat dropper, uh, their nickel player buzzes way underneath it. It's a Tom and, Johnson play, right? Yes, yes, yes a yeah. great coverage play on him, and he's playing great anyways. But yeah. the Tua on that play again, his feet are telling him that he's late. He doesn't have the arm talent to make it up. As soon as he's late, it, the play is more or less dead it's the room for error it's just so small and sometimes it works out for him like the raheem mostert dunk uh, uh that he should not have thrown like he got baited mm. in that cover i'm sure bills like sean mcdermott was like you gotta be kidding me they baited him on that throw right. to ex throw it exactly where the bills wanted to throw it mostert turned into randy moss for five seconds but the 
I, I think that's where that's where the criticisms of Tua come from. Yes, he is a great on time processor and he's a great pre snap processor and he he can throw the ball quick and accurately, but it's really nice when there's no defender on the screen. And yes, you're throwing it out and you're those holes are big and you're making sure that the holes are big because of how you're throwing it. But again, like you're saying, is when things get difficult, what are you lifting it up or are you guys just the almost like seven second or less sons that as soon as you have to get into a half court offense, that's like, Oh, like you're not, they can't generate any points when they have to grind it out this way. So right. that, and that that's, that's what you have to offense like that. You have to be able to have a game script like that and not saying like the dolphins aren't going to be able to blow out a lot of teams the rest of the season. They're gonna, but the bills are really freaking good and they're really good on both sides of the ball. They have an offense that go toe to toe with you and they have a defense that's going to make it really tough and a vet defense that knows how to pass everything off. I thought they did like the another basketball reference. They basically did the Jordan rules against them. They packed the paint, packed the middle, got physical with all the receivers and they were just saying, we'll let you throw it to the outside. We're just going to stay in the middle. The, the bills linebackers didn't even care about the flat. They just stay in the middle. It was hilarious because they knew Tua wouldn't check it down over there. I think he did it once. Um, so it was Awesome game plan from the Bills, but again, this is like what what you're saying. What I'm hinting at is that like that's why some of these upper tier quarterbacks that we talk about, the Allens of the world, the Mahomeses of the world, the Herberts of the world, they can kind of create when all this other stuff is not going well. When the defense kind of has your number, what you're calling. Yeah, yeah, I I, I remember the the Teron Johnson play that we were just talking about. You know, when you see Tua, he throws that ball out there, and it's just hanging, man. For- Ever. Because, because look, Teron Johnson, he made a good play on the ball, but he had to run a bit to actually yep. get to the point. And you know, Tyreek Hill jumps, he catches the ball, but he has to jump so high because it's looping, and he's just kind of like hanging in the air. Where yeah. are my feet? Where's the sideline? And then before he can land, Teron gets Johnson shoved gets shoved out, and that's a part where you're making it a little bit difficult for the guys around you. So, yeah, I, 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 and you know, I, I guess what I should say, I'm not even sure how many times this is going to be a problem for them, like where they're coming back from games. Don't expect to be right. a problem next week in the Giants. But when you play the Bills or the Chiefs in the postseason, that's your competition, you yes. know? Not not the Broncos. This, this is, is your competition. This Every good Shanahan offense uh, is you have to have a favorable game script. It's always the same. Make them drop back. Make them play from behind. You And it's like, oh, okay, I'll do that. But it's like, you got to. You got to do it. <laughs> you, know, you know, those teams, the 49ers and the Dolphins right now, their defense, is, or the, at least the 49ers defense is pretty, pretty freaking good. So they're really tough. But same with the Dolphins. It's like, OK, yeah, most teams aren't going to be able to do that. But the elite teams are. And that's the difference between playoff football and regular season football. And, and right there was a good example of it. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens with the Dolphins moving forward. I don't I don't think it's time to hit the panic button no. necessarily, but. It, it was an eye-opening thing that there's some things to fix and some things to tweak and think about yeah. as the season moves on. And Mike, Mike McDaniel's shown already, I I had to give him benefit of the doubt of, that he's very aware of all these things. I don't think he's one right. of those coaches that's like, hey, it's been working. Let's just keep doing it. Even last year when they hit, they got their, you know, kind of felt hit some speed bumps against the Chargers and then a couple other games too. He re- revamped the offense on the fly. So I think we're going to see some new twists for him. I, I He's earned enough credit for me that I'm like, he's going to find some new answers. He, he's he's really good at what he does. I agree. I will say last thing though, before we get out of here, we talked about this last night. It's really gross when that offense is not working. Like it looks so, so nasty. Gross. They, it, it was it, that one RPO, man. I was like, oh, that. God. I even said it to you. I said, that's not football. And I, <laughs> I, I don't want to sound like that, but it wasn't. <laughs> when it's not working, you, it's you not. Hit the little, little cheese plays that take less than two seconds to develop, you know? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. a cheese play is, it gets blitzed and the ball has to come out really quickly. It's like, it just, it's like, what is that? And yeah, that, 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 that uh, that's what happens when sometimes you're doing some, I, I, I want to hesitate to use the word gimmicky, but, you know, unique type of operation uh, uh, for offense. When it doesn't work, it looks really ugly. Yeah. All right. Nate, before we get out of here, anything you want to let people know you're working on, either at Yahoo or The Athletic? Um, no, for the uh, for Yahoo, I got a new edition of the Overhang coming out on Thursday. Uh, should be a pretty fun one. I, what, what do I have working on? I think you I'm going to describe to people what the Overhang is. So the Overhang, uh, my gimmick is I, I highlight a player, a play. A game plan, uh, a prospect for next year's draft, and then a a prop for the Thursday night game. This week, right now, leaders in the clubhouse for the player. And it's going to be players. I'm cheating this week, but I'm going to do the kids are all right. C.J. Stroud and Anthony Richardson, just because both are just Richardson honestly made about seven crack, throws crack that plays, dude. are the greatest 
like uh, yeah not a lot of guys can do what he's doing right now and stroud's really good too so um and then the play i'm gonna look at see how you're doing a little fun formation a little double sidecar formation i'm not mm-hmm. gonna call it by its other name that someone else wants to popularize some certain college coach and then uh yeah i don't know what i'm gonna do for the plan i think it might be bill's defense but we'll see but yeah, yeah. that's that's what i'm working on uh for yahoo right now all right cool so that's gonna do it for this episode of the exemplist thank you to may for coming on next week send us a voicemail <laughs> Like, we're gonna start listening to what you guys have to say. Oh I, I'm, I know, I know. I'm, I'm down to get into the sewer with you guys. So, <laughs> if you have a voicemail, you got a question, a comment, want to make fun of me for whatever reason, uh, you can send it to speakpipe.com/zeroblitz. That's speakpipe.com/zero uh, zero blitz. Ask me a question. Send me your hottest take. We'll listen. Reply to them on the show. If you make me cry, we'll definitely reply to you on the show. We'll be back with another episode of The Exemplist every Tuesday. Tune in tomorrow for an episode of Inside Coverage with Jason Fitz, Charles Robinson, Jory Epstein. I'm Charles McDonald. I'm at Four Words on Twitter. You can find Nate on Twitter at Nate underscore Tice. Producer behind the glass, Stone Rochelle. You can find him on Twitter at SJ Rochelle. Leave a five-star review. Tell a friend. Share the Zero Blitz podcast feed. And we will see you next week.